Welcome to Wealth Without Borders podcast. And this is one of the longer, more conversational podcasts that I'm producing. And I'm delighted to have with me today, Francis Kramer. Welcome to the show, Francis. Thank you very much, Harold. And uh, whereabouts are you in the world and what's the weather like today? Well, the easiest answer is I'm very close to Shanghai. Okay. The place is called Jiaxing. It's about 30 minutes away from Shanghai by train. But most of my friends have never ever been here, even the Chinese ones. Right. <laughs> and the weather is fantastic today. Really warm and it's actually quite nice to be in China these days. Yeah, one of my favorite times of the year. And for those of you who uh, don't know Francis, he's an expert in sales. He's been in sales for many, many years. And the latest manifestation of that is that he's a sales director in the Chinese electric vehicle or EV market. And that's a massive part of the automotive industry. And Francis's role is to take a Chinese company and make it truly international in scope. However, he also considers himself a flexpat. And we're going to discuss exactly what that means during the show. So we will get to flexpat, Francis, but just to ask you, why did you become an expat in the first place? Actually, the first time I came to China was in 2000. Four. That is, uh, lots of the listeners here might have still been in school and others might have already been in during their career. Yeah. But for me, it was a very important step in my uh, education. I was still in university and there was a chance to teach English in China. And it was really quite interesting. It was a great chance. I learned a couple of things. One of them was that it's China is a different world and it was really nice i had the chance to go there i even tried to learn some chinese i came back a year later again for an internship and it was a bit more professional because i was working in the field of my studies but i was still not an expat and i had this idea that one day i'm going to come back to china as a professional and this took some time and i was always dreaming about this at the same time i was pursuing my international career and this dream of coming to china was getting more and more difficult i was a sales expert and as you know sales people are professional in their field with their contacts so i was in germany i was working with swiss and austrian and german and maybe the odd european customer maybe somebody in singapore but definitely not in china so it was difficult for me but I, always wanted to be an expat and looking back now four years ago i'm so happy i made this choice to come to china right and what what was it that you feel was special or is special about living and working in china in particular well i always use this uh, this story that most of my friends that are in their 30s now they grew up with parents that were making like 100 euros a month and had a bicycle and now they drive cars and they buy homes and they go on holiday abroad and maybe they even send their kids to university somewhere abroad so it's a total different life that they have here people talk about what they have now in very a lot of, a lot of gratitude but they also expect that it's going to go be better mm -hmm. and if i go back to my hometown it's i feel that people are protected to have the same lifestyle that their parents used to have. And sometimes they don't, you know? Mm. And so it's a different place to be. And I really enjoy this, to be in China, to, to feel this development that people build something from the scratch and they enjoy it and they don't protect themselves. And I have met very few people that seem unhappy in their life. Yeah. I mean, I would endorse all of that as a, as an expat in China myself, there's a tremendous dynamism here, a positive energy uh, that doesn't tend to get into the news media in the West. Anyway, we mustn't get too political. So talking of home and the difference between China and back home, obviously there's a difference in terms of ambition, I think, and expectation. But how do you personally cope as an expat with being far away from your family, your friends? 
in China? Well, family is where you live and, and the place where you really live and where you want to be. So my, I'm a son of uh, six children. So we had, I have five brothers and sisters with the same mom and the same dad. And uh, my mom passed away this year. So it was really, really tough for me to be away uh, during Corona. Uh, but I was surrounded by my family. So my family was taking care of this and it was a fantastic time to be able to experience this online and to be really having the feeling that I don't have to carry this burden by myself. I can enjoy this life abroad because I have people who look after me and look after my family. And also my dad is 73 now and he makes it a habit to come to China once a year. And so he's the absolute star in his uh, kind of old age um, Boy Scouts club at home because nobody gets to go to China. And he goes there every year and it's, it's totally normal for him. So I asked myself, how can I support my family? And by doing what I do, I can help them much more than coming for coffee every week. Mm. And this is something I try to tell myself every week again, whenever I think it, I'm far away from home, I think, well, this is my home and I take my family with her, with me. Right. And they're really, really grateful for that. Yeah. Great. And I mean, I feel very similar. We just had uh, a birthday party on WeChat, which is, uh, for those who don't know, a major app in China. And we were all celebrating across the world. So it's different, but it's just as valid. Uh, the family was together. And so what would you say defines the qualities um, of an expat in general, but perhaps particularly here in China? Well, I must honestly say before I come into the soft skills, I have to say that it's very important if you're an expat, you should be a master in your skill. You should have something that you can bring to the table that you can do better than anyone else. And I must say that there are people who I doubt that they have this. So they get along, they have something, maybe they have a good contract, good company, I don't know. But Somehow I, let, I, I like, okay, what's the value here? So before people tell you it's mindset, you need to be open and see the positive parts and so on. To me, that's pretty much, sorry, I, I don't take it very seriously. I need to tell you that my job in China is to help people with something they cannot do themselves. And when the stage is reached that this case is not necessary anymore, well, I hope I have enough money to retire. So I think it's a good time to be talking on this in this podcast. Mm. But for me, this is the case. So I bring something to the table that people need. And they're very grateful they have me, extremely grateful, because I give them some very honest feedback about very complex topics. It's something you don't get so often in China. And this makes me unique in this role. And I currently don't have the feeling that I need to protect my job. It's, okay. it's very, but I'm a master of my skill. I've been in sales for a long time and it's unique that people like me want to work in China. Yeah. And then what would you say, we've talked about some of the good things, some of the advantages of being in China. What would you say are some of the disadvantages? Well, obviously I can, I have got totally used to not being open opening all the kind of websites, all kind of uh, YouTube channels and so on, you get used to this. So uh, also in, when I was back in, in Germany, um, you really get to do a lot of holiday stuff easily. So you can go skiing, you can um, visit some friends in Austria and go to Salzburg. And I don't know, uh, you can go to a swimming pool, everything will be organized and safe. And um, you can go hiking the mountains, go to Paris. And there's lots of stuff which you can do in a private level in Europe, which is really nice. In China, if you want to enjoy yourself, you go somewhere, there will be like thousands of people doing the same. Very protected. Um, it's not so natural. So for me, I kind of really enjoy going to Europe and just doing some casual stuff. And I do miss this. I would like to climb the Alps again and sleep in some hut in Austria. And, you know, I don't know. There's lots of stuff 
which I really miss. But that's my life here. And um, it's not going to change so quickly. So I just had a bike trip in, in Western China and really enjoyed this. But it it requires a lot more self-discipline than it does in Europe. So I really, in China, have to look for something to find something similar to hiking the Alps in Austria. Mm -hmm. It's possible, but it's much more difficult. And if you just go somewhere where there's a holiday area, it's not like what I feel holiday. It's, it's, yeah. it's a Chinese way of holiday. It's different. So I miss that. I mean, people who live in China will know that, but people not living in China might be quite surprised that some of the massive continent is obviously so hugely populated that areas become crowded and it can be a challenge to find peace and quiet easily. Um, we're going to get to Flexpat in just a minute because this is kind of a fascinating area to me. But what would you say if you had to extract your biggest learning from being an expat, what would that be for you? Well, now I, I think I will come into the soft skills area again, and that I normally try to avoid, but I came to China thinking that I know how it works. And it took a few months, and then I thought, okay, I think I don't know how it works. The problem is, if you're an expert in China, you're very exposed. So you're far away from the headquarter that is kind of hired you in the first place. So if you share your concerns, for example, I cannot do this job because one, two, three, you're risking your job. So you tend to not share this. So you keep it for yourself. You talk to the Chinese about this, they, yeah, they will say, yeah, you just get it done somehow. Um, it's difficult to, to discuss this. So what I learned for myself is to understand, okay, some things work differently than I thought. And I have to cope with this somehow, and nobody's going to help me. I have to get it done. It's going to be difficult. But when it's done, I'm going to be like an expert in this area because I can explain some, something that nobody else can explain because the one people in China, for them, is normal. The other ones in Europe, for them, it's unbelievable. So I'm the one to, able to tell them, okay, you can do it, but this, this, this way, and please, you can try it another way, but you will take three years to learn it just like I did. Right. So your suffering results in other people's time saving. Yes, I can help them to save their own journey. Mm -hmm. In German, there is something similar. I grew up with a, a mom from Ireland and uh, my dad uh, used to talk English sometimes. And there was one saying we always used in English that was, some people have to learn the hard way. Right. Yeah, and this is exactly something what I have behind me, and um, I think an expert expat in China has to learn to learn the hard way. There is no shortcut. You can mm -hmm. try to talk to people like you and me, save the journey, but some some things you you have to be ready to to go the hard way. Yeah, I agree. And then um, tell us more about what is a flexpat. Well, this is something, this word is not brand new. So it's, I've seen it in a couple of job advertisements in the last five years. Um, more or less, mostly uh, published by European headhunters. They are looking for an expat kind of position talent in China. But they also know that hiring an expat is very expensive and also not very sustainable. So you hire somebody, you have to make sure how to get him or her over to China, uh, get a visa, look after the family, and so on and so on and so on. Pay European salary plus X. You're not sure if the person likes it. You're not sure if his family likes it. You're not sure if they're working hard. There is lots of risk involved. So people look for a talent that is already in China. And then they will think about an option, how to make it attractive for this person to accept an offer. So typically this kind of job will be paid better than local positions. It's very difficult for companies to design a payment scheme for this. So normally there's no payment scheme. So it's a negotiation. People will come up with a package and nobody knows and you say yes or no. Right. So this was the background where I called this name a couple of times, but I actually only called it maybe three or four times, very, very few times. Normally, 
something like this is called a local hire. But what is a local hire? I mean, it's also not a very clear word. So mm. I came up with this uh, word and tried to make it very, you know, well known to talk to my friends about this. And, you know, I always had to explain it. Everyone was like, what is a flex pad again? Mm -hmm. And then, as I said before, I didn't hear it. I didn't invent it. I heard it a couple of times. And so I, I really don't want to take the claim for it, but it was certainly not well known. Mm. So I found a couple of friends um, and we started uh, with one guy called Patrick. We started a podcast about this and we, we brain, we, we kind of marketed this name on LinkedIn. And so it gets more and more and more well known, but still uh, people discuss if they are in this position. So if they were hired locally in China for an expat role, are they an expat or are they a local hire or are they a flex pet? What are they? <laughs> And in my time in China, I've met at least 50, 60, 70, 80 people who fit this role, probably more. Yeah. Uh, some, some would say they're expats. Some would say, well, I'm in China and I take the best paid job. You know? uh, but what combines them is that they typically have a lower set of security. So they don't have the backing of headquarters. So if their contact runs out, their visa runs out, and they have to leave the country. Right. They cannot go back to their old job, so they have to find a new job, or they have to move in with their parents back home. Right. It's it's quite it's it's quite it's a life choice, and I'm not the only one. There's a couple of people who do this. So, yeah, I came up with this idea to say let's make it well known, and obviously we've been doing this for a few months now, five six months, and feedback is great, really great. So I think it was the the right track. Well, it got you on this show, right? I think because uh, it did. Yes, <laughs> and I understand you've just launched a a FlexPat website. That's right. Finished yesterday after recording. So maybe when this is published, maybe it was already well known before. But uh, yeah. you know, it's for me, it's a brand new thing. And we'll we'll put the link in the uh, in the podcast of that FlexPat dot com, I believe. And chinaflexpat.com. I beg your pardon, chinaflexpat.com. So, um, you know, my understanding is there's a particular change in demographics going on in China anyway, prior to 2020, with more people oh, yes. coming flexpat oh, yes. localized. Or, oh, yes. How do you see the future for the expat or flexpat in terms of? You know, are expats still going to be as needed? Now we're all living in Zoom land, uh, <laughs> as we are demonstrating today. Well, there is definitely a big couple of changes. So what I would say that the big change happening is that, first of all, there will be more people who are willing to choose a lifestyle like this, like me. When I did this, I was having, when I decided to work in China, 2016, I had a job. I was making more than 5,000 euros after tax in Germany, which is a lot of money. It's difficult to, to get this. I was working in Frankfurt, having an apartment with Frankfurt, relatively comfortable cost of living, could save about 3,000 euros a month after tax. A lot of money. Yeah. I chose to, you know, take a new offer in China, which was also well paid, but with much less security, with total new set and People didn't really understand this, especially when I told them that I'm going to do sales in China and they said, well, sales, come on, they speak Chinese, so how are you going to do that? You know? And um, so it sounded a bit like, uh, you know, in German we say this Aussteiger, you know, someone leaves the system and wants to try something new. Yeah. But now I meet people who maybe didn't have this background, so they didn't have this comfortable lifestyle in the past, and they're in a situation where they think, well, it's difficult in in my home country and China is the new world. So I'm going to try it. You know, why not? I don't have anything to lose. So I had something to lose, but I didn't, I wanted to lose. I'm really sure this is going to change. There are more people who want to try it in China and who just will give themselves one, two years to try it out. And worst case, they're going to go back. Right. So this will be different. The other thing will be different is that the typical know-how gap between Europeans or Americans as in expert positions and Chinese will get lower and lower. 
So there's not the real need to get somebody, some foreigner to work in a foreign company in China to educate the team on something that they wouldn't figure out themselves. So there is a less need for foreigners to do a typical expert job. Of course, if, for example, an engineer has been building, in my industry has been building an EV motor for five years in Munich for BMW, and they want to develop the same motor in China and Shenyang, they will still appreciate the expat that has this very, very in-depth know-how of this, and it's very difficult to, to change. But maybe if they are far-sighted, they will hire a Chinese in Munich to work there for five years and then go back to China and do the same job. Right. So I really, I still believe that even in these cases, there will be less uh, requirement for the typical expat, for someone that one company sends to another place in another, especially in this case, China, and do something that the local people cannot do for some reason. Right. The other thing is just when it comes together, I would say you have a kind of a difficult situation now because obviously you have less need for expats and you have more talents more people that want to do that kind of job. Now it comes to the thing what I said in the beginning. If you want to be an expert, you need to be flexible. Yes, you need to be creative and happy to do the hard, uh, learn the hard way, but you also need to be a master in your trade. So now I meet people who come to China when they're very young and they have a business background. And maybe they speak some Chinese and they think they're going to make it here. And I'm going to say, you guys are going to have a hard time. So yes, you can, you can, yeah, you, you're going to find a job. So I do think there's more and more opportunities, but I'm not sure if you're going to make a good living and make a lot of money in China. Mm. So it's a lifestyle choice. So I, I'm, I'm very concerned myself. So I like to earn a lot of money and save a lot of money. And currently it's I'm in a very comfortable situation because I'm an expert, well-paid and with a low cost of living here in China, which I choose. I'm not sure if this stays this way, um, but I think there will be a change in this industry. There will be a lot of opportunities for people who want to try it, but they will not be in a position to sell themselves as the very kind of, a, a small species that wants to be well paid and well treated with everything what uh, what is associated with an expert job right yeah i mean i do agree you need tangible expert skills that china wants and uh, ironically perhaps there may be more expats from china going out to the rest of the world as you've said to uh, bring their skills in fact in certain yes. areas so well, just to change the tone a little bit, Francis. Um, sure. You've got a very, I've got lots of these, but I'm not going to bore the audience with all of mine. But have you got um, some funny memories or one funny memory of China you could share with us? Yes, of course. So I've been uh, going to um, some different uh, customers recently. And um, I always remember this one time when I went to, uh, a customer and they were a very like a, a Chinese automotive company and they built cars and so lots of company secrets. And if you do that at Volkswagen in Germany, this, it takes a half an hour of protocol. You have to close your phone and whatever, very complicated. And at the time, uh, it took a while. The taxi driver didn't even find the right place. And then we went there and then the guy in the entrance did say, hey, you go that way and then make a right and when left, left again, you're going to find it. And lots of brand new cars standing around there and um, go in the meeting room. You know, everything was so, so un-Volkswagen, you know, so mm -hmm. totally relaxed. Um, and this is, of course, changing, but it, it's just one of these memories that I have to, to China that is so, so different. And you don't expect it, but if you can enjoy it, it makes life really cool and this yeah i like to be in china because i'm always waiting for this to happen again for some yeah. strange moment that happens i have a and story daily. Like, uh, like that where i uh, went to visit ford in um pudong which is over the river in shanghai mm. to find a client of mine only to find that the entire floor that he was working on had been moved i think up a floor or up two floors so I simply went up the back stairs of the 
building up to that floor. And there was a door marked, he was involved with innovation at, at uh, Ford, and walked in the door and said, oh, hello, I'm here to see you. And he looked at me absolutely horrified because in that room were all the future secrets of uh, the Ford Motor Company. So luckily I'm a man yeah. of expression, but uh, of course, I know what you mean. <laughs> and then lastly, just to finish off, this has been a very interesting journey around flexibility, but if you had to go back and do it all again, either from the 2004 point potentially or the 2016 point what would you change well <laughs> i got divorced in 2020 so maybe <laughs> <laughs> well uh, okay well i mean maybe you always you grow up and um, yeah so maybe that was the reason that i didn't come to china earlier because my ex-wife, let's just be frank, uh, she is a Chinese and uh, she was living in Germany just like I'm living in China. And for her, it was too early to go back to China. She wanted to enjoy Germany at the time, finish her university, and it's great. We had a great time together. I also had a great time to explore this career of uh, being a sales guy. It took me a long time, to be honest. It took four, about four years until I was making a good salary in sales. So had I gone to China in 2005, maybe with without the, the ex-wife, who knows, um, maybe I would have got a great similar chance. That I maybe have a mentor, maybe an expert, like in my role now, that would just teach me everything I need to know to be uh, in the same position where I am now, maybe. But it's very risky. I'm very glad uh, for lots of mentors I had in Germany that had nothing to do with China at all. They were just explaining to me how to qualify, how to make sure that you have a good negotiation, how to make sure that you're well prepared, that you come to a meeting on time, you dress well, and so on. It takes some time to learn this. And it's, I, I wouldn't have learned this in China. Right. So I'm really glad about this. Also glad about being married for a long time. Uh, yeah. You know, it comes as it goes. So I'm unhappy as I'm now, but I think I'm often wondering, had I come to China earlier, I'm, I think I'm learning more the way I'm living now than when I used to be in Germany. So I think I would have come to China earlier. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for that. That's been a fascinating journey into the flexible side of expat life. And uh, if people want to reach out to you and continue the conversation with you about, you know, what it takes to be a flexpat, whether indeed perhaps they should be a flexpat, or how do they reach you? Well, I'm on LinkedIn, obviously, Francis Kramer, very easy to find. And please, also, the China Flexpat website is very easy to find. And uh, please share this idea. I'm really trying to to get some kind of stage for this, to say it's nice to live in China. It's nice to fulfill your dream. It's not only about saving money and hoping to have a nice retirement. It's also about enjoying what you do now. And so please feel free, reach out, find me anyway. I'm happy to share. And are you happy for us to put your LinkedIn link on the podcast? Of course. Of course. All right. Well, thank you so much, Francis. And, uh, I'm sure that many a Flexpat will be reaching out to you and checking out your website. So thanks for being on the show. And thanks, Howard. I think you're doing a great job. I must say that I've been in contact with a couple of people in your industry, let's say like this. And I'm very, I think what you do is, is great because you, you get people connected and talking about important matters and educating them. I really like the way you work. So Oh, it's really great to be in touch. Bless you. Thank you so much. All right. Take care, Francis. And we will see each other maybe outside of Zoom as we're both in or near Shanghai. You never know. 30 minutes by train, like I said. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Many thanks for checking out Wealth Without Borders podcast. I'd love you to head over to iTunes, subscribe and leave us a review. And if you'd be kind enough to do that, I would really appreciate it. And then if you want to know more about what I do, 
check out many thanks for checking out wealth without borders podcast i'd love you to head over to itunes subscribe and leave us a review and if you'd be kind enough to do that i would really appreciate it and then if you want to know more about what i do check out